Hello everyone, and welcome to the third and final part of the Chernobyl Iceberg. Finally, we have reached layers 8, 9, and 10 of the iceberg. The very bottom of the chart, and a trivia that very few people who are interested in this subject actually know. It's the moment I've been building to for weeks, so let's crack on with it. If you enjoy this content, make sure to like and subscribe, so I know that people are continuing to enjoy watching my work, and it allows me to continue making these videos. And now, without further ado, let's begin the final part of this marathon series. MKER Reactors The MKER, or Multi-Loop Pressure Tube Power Reactor, is the final stage of evolution for the RBMK reactor. Featuring a secondary containment while housing many of the RBMK's unique features, such as the ability to refuel the machine while it is operational, it was more efficient, safer, and cost-effective to build. It has been claimed that these will be built at Kursk and Chernobyl in the future, however these were never completed. MI8 lands next to Cafe. The sand bombing campaign of Reactor 4 had to use sand from the area where Micro District 6 would be built, with soldiers and civilians being responsible for filling the sandbags. As such, the helicopters would land close to the Pripyat Cafe on the waterfront, which was actually captured on video on April the 27th. The control room video and audio is locked in Moscow. Video footage and audio recordings of the control room on the night of April 26, 1986 is known to exist. However, it was confiscated by the Prosecutor's General Office following the disaster. This vital information remains locked in the office in Moscow, and it is unknown if it will ever be released. Some information about the audio recording is known, however. It turns out that, unfortunately, the microphone for the reactor control desk that Topsnov was operating was in fact not operational at the time of the accident, so no audio from Topsnov or anyone around the reactor panels is available. Furthermore, there is a splice in the audio at the start of the turbine rundown, meaning that crucial audio may have been removed. 2022 Russian TV series an 11 episode TV series has been released about the Chernobyl disaster. Created supposedly to tell the true story, following their complaints about inaccuracy in HBO, it instead repeats the CIA agent planting a bomb conspiracy. This has been in development for years, the trailer for the series was published in 2019, but deleted due to backlash. Missing firefighter helmet from hospital number 126. It is well known that the firefighter clothing was left in the basement of hospital number 126 due to the elevated levels of radioactive contamination. The considerable number of people attempting to enter the basement, including one case of someone trying to wear the firefighter uniforms, resulted in the Ukrainian government filling the entrance to the basement with sand to make entry impossible. However, one tourist had pulled out one of the firefighter helmets from inside and left it at the entrance to the hospital. By 2021, it had disappeared, and nobody knows where it has gone. If it has left the exclusion zone, it could be spreading radioactive contamination as you watch. Graphite in Jupiter Factory A number of intact and damaged blocks of graphite, of the same design and dimension as those used inside an RBMK reactor, have been found within the basement of the Jupiter Factory in Pripyat. The graphite blocks were presumably taken from the graphite stack intended for Unit 5, or were defective pieces of graphite and moved to the basement for unknown reasons. Unit 7 to 12. Six additional units were planned at Chernobyl once Units 5 and 6 were complete. Details on these reactors are very sparse, however it is presumed that they would have been MKER reactors, like those mentioned earlier, and would have used cooling towers like Units 5 and 6 of Chernobyl, due to the lack of any additional water. These reactors were considered necessary by the administration of the nuclear power plant, as almost half of the Pripyat City employees were related to the construction industry, and they needed to keep the workers employed. Launch on VT2 Several photographs from the construction of Units 3 and 4 
show workers having lunch atop the second vent tower, a taste into the world before the disaster at Chernobyl. Zook Hydro Project Zook Hydro Project is a hydrotechnical firm specialising in dams and canals. Due to the amount of water involved in the RBMK reactor, Zook Hydro Project was selected to design the second generation RBMK building and build Chernobyl MPP, Kursk MPP and Smolensk MPP. This is why the Leningrad nuclear power plant and Ignalina nuclear power plant were not mentioned in detail in the iceberg, as they were built by separate organisations. Valentina Karpenko You may not be familiar with the name or face of Valentina Karpenko, but you have almost certainly heard her. She is the voice of the woman on the firefighter phone call on the night of the disaster, summoning firefighters to help extinguish the blades. Karpenko passed away in November of 2020. Stalker Bridge in Martinovici. Martinovici is a village along the southern border of the exclusion zone. The village is notable for having a bridge used to cross a major river into the exclusion zone undetected. The village was destroyed in the 2020 wildfires. Four ways to vent an RBMK. The RBMK has four distinct ways of discharging steam. There is one method of dumping steam to the condensers, one that dumps it out of the vent stack at the top of the building, and one that dumps steam to the bubbler pools below the reactor. The final system is the emergency discharge vents at the side of the building. The claw was used in the turbine hall. The claw of death was caught in one photo during the liquidation of Chernobyl, being hung in the turbine hall. It was likely used to remove the nuclear core elements that fell in here as the roof collapsed, hence why it is so radioactive today. The Lenin Head A giant bust of Vladimir Lenin was originally placed outside of the main administration building of Chernobyl, during the period when Ukraine was a part of the Soviet Union. After the collapse of the nation, the Lenin head was eventually moved into a storage room to remain in hiding. There is another Lenin head in the exclusion zone that was painted and left on show publicly. During the 2022 invasion, it was moved and used for target practice. Turbine purge vents. The turbines can be purged off steam, if necessary, through a series of bypass vents that releases the steam into the air, creating a large white cloud reminiscent of an explosion, seen here at Smolensk nuclear power plant. The third switchyard. There were two major switchyards to the south of the nuclear power plant, those being the 750 kV switchyard and 330 kV switchyard. However, many forget the much smaller 110 kV switchyard tucked into the corner of the space. AZ-5 double press theory. The DREG computer notes an abnormality regarding the AZ-5 button. There appears to be two different signals for the AZ-5 button being pressed, once at 123.39 and a second time at 123.41. This has led many to suggest that Toptonov mistakenly let go of the button for a second, which some people, including the former senior reactor control engineer for Unit 3, Fatikov, have since claimed this stopped the control rod movement, which worsened the effect of the graphite displacers. Hodumchuk Memorial Upgrade The Hodumchuk Memorial has expanded since it was initially opened. In original photos of the memorial shortly after it was installed, you can see a very small object with a series of pipes close to the memorial. Later, after the shutdown of Unit 3, these pipes were removed and an elevated base around the memorial was created, raising it off the floor. Later still, in the late 2010s, the wall to the right of the memorial was knocked down, and a decorative wall behind the memorial was created. Today, the only part of the original Hodumchuk memorial is the wooden plaque. RBMK can survive a plane crash. Many people point to the lack of a secondary containment as a major weakness in the design of the RBMK reactor, suggesting that it may have been prone to external and internal explosions that may have been prevented with the large concrete dome over the reactor. However, the building itself was in fact extremely durable. The RBMK reactor and its containment building was designed to withstand a large direct plane crash to the building without compromising the safety of the reactor. The last shift of Razim Davletbayev. Razim Davletbayev was the deputy head of the turbine workshop for operation and was present in the Unit 4 control room during the explosion. He assisted in fighting the fires in the turbine hall that night and survived despite a significant radiation dose. His testimony was published under the title 
the last shift of Razim Davletbayev. He passed away March 5, 2017. The mobile laboratory was a Mercedes truck. Remember the mobile laboratory mentioned in layer 7? It was in fact a Mercedes-Benz NG85 model vehicle, and it had an interesting story. After being produced in West Germany, it was transported to Switzerland to be upgraded with specialist equipment to record vibrations produced by turbines, and then purchased by the Soviet Union. It had been in use for less than six months when the 1986 disaster occurred. In early May, the vehicle was driven out of the turbine hall to the front of the building. However, complete decontamination could not be guaranteed, and the vehicle is now presumed buried, the location undisclosed. Reactor 4 is sinking into the ground. Linked to the sarcophagus being unstable, the walls of the sarcophagus have been tracked in recent years, and it has been shown that the very walls are literally sinking into the ground and dragging Unit 4 with it. Just another reason to accelerate the dismantling of the sarcophagus. Parts from Control Room 4 were used in other control rooms. The control room of Chernobyl Unit 4 after the accident was never fully stripped of the buttons and switches until much later. Some were taken for evidence to the cause of the explosion, while others were stolen by liquidators and visitors to the control room as souvenirs. However, it is known that some buttons and switches were in fact used in the control rooms of the other units. Which ones in particular remain unknown. The amusement park was open before the disaster. There are claims that the ferris wheel was opened the day after the disaster to distract the population from the evacuation. There is no evidence to support this, including no witness testimony. A photo claims to show the ferris wheel in use, supposedly proving the April 27th amusement park opening theory. However, it's actually taken in March, during testing of the equipment before it officially opened. The fire cones. On the night of April the 26th, multiple eyewitnesses including Armin Abagayan, Nikolai Karpan, Viktor Smagin, among others, all report seeing pillars of fire erupting out of the destroyed reactor hall of Unit 4 like a geyser, with no definitive explanation as to why. Some even describe the flames as being black, however this has never been confirmed. Dyatlov's grave location. It is widely known that Anatoly Dyatlov's grave is within the Lizov Cemetery, located in the city of Kiev. However, the precise location of the grave is kept hidden from the general public amidst the masses of tombstones to prevent people from defacing the object. Instead, the coordinates of the grave are passed on from person to person to allow them to visit the grave and pay respects. Even artwork has been left at the site. Green Cape Green Cape is a small village that was built to house liquidators of the exclusion zone roughly 30 kilometers from Chernobyl, on the northern bank of the Tetarev River. Despite being such a serious place, it was still a good standard of life, and the government tried its best to keep the liquidators happy, for example hosting discos at Green Cape. B1 Olenyok The B1 Olenyok gas mask is a breathing apparatus that was specifically designed for use inside the Chernobyl sarcophagus. Today, they are harder to collect, and many are in a damaged condition. The man who was in the Unit 3 reactor hall during the explosion. Igor Olenik was a Unit 3 reactor hall operator at the time of the explosion. He was actually stood in the reactor hall near the spent fuel pools and felt the refueling machine strike him in the back as it dropped from the force. He ran from the hall only to find the door had been locked and as he was banging on the door for his colleagues to open it, he saw steam and smoke descending from the ceiling as it was sucked in by ventilation from Unit 4. He ultimately survived and gave his interview on Kupni's YouTube channel. 1984 Unit 3-4 Reactor Hall Accidents It has been revealed in KGB documents that a mishap occurred at the Unit 3 and 4 reactor halls of the Chernobyl nuclear power plant. This was caused by improper installation of the steam separator insulation, which collapsed exposing the concrete panels of the Unit 4 reactor hall to temperatures in excess of 270 degrees Celsius. This ultimately led to cracks in the floor slabs 
as well as their displacement and partial collapse of the wall panels around the reactor hull. The damage was more extensive in Unit 3 due to its age. The KGB reported the issue to the nuclear power plant management and it was fixed shortly thereafter. Chernobyl nuclear power plant workers on April 27th came home to Pripyat evacuated. The workers on the day shift on the April 27th were not made aware of the evacuation and left the nuclear power plant to find the large columns of buses taking the civilians out of Pripyat. The workers were told to remain in one building together, but their official evacuation was not permitted at this time. Twinned with Chernobyl. A long-held joke around the UK is to pick communities that people do not like and write Twinned with Chernobyl on the sign. Famous victims include Grimsby, Slough and Sunderland. Old Sarcophagus Plans The original sarcophagus schemes differ from what we know today. They are actually a lot smaller, as the original plan sees some sort of ring around the base of the power plant, with a cover over the entire turbine hull roof, and a different design for the cascade wall to the north. A little detail you may find interesting. Diagnostic Boy Prototypes The diagnostic boys used in the reactor hall of Chernobyl Unit 4 were not the first ones created. Prototypes developed by the Kachatov Institute are known to exist and have been photographed, although their current whereabouts are unknown. The Real Death Toll The real death toll of the Chernobyl nuclear disaster is not known, with estimates ranging from 31 to 450,000. Based upon the knowledge that 100 millisieverts of radiation is the lowest accumulated dose of radiation people can receive before the risk of cancer starts to increase, we can assume that an excess of 8,250 deaths will occur due to cancer. Given the ratio of non-cancer deaths to cancer deaths in radiation exposure is 2 to 1, we can assume there will be 24,750 total deaths due to Chernobyl. A full explanation can be seen in the background. The second fire on May 23rd, 1986. On the night of May 23rd, 1986, a fire was reported in the cable area of the North Main Circulation Pump Hole. Initial attempts to contain the blaze saw one firefighter fall into a hole, breaking his leg. It was ultimately decided not to attempt to extinguish the electrical fire due to the intense radiation in the area, leaving cables to burn as the power to Unit 4 was officially disconnected. Third reactor shut down days before the initial shutdown. The third reactor suffered two incidents that forced a premature shutdown days before the official shutdown. The first, on November 19th, 2000, saw the reactor disconnected from the electric grid due to a short circuit as a result of ice building up on the 750 kilovolt Vinitsa line. This also resulted in two other reactors shutting down, one at Zaporizhia and another at South Ukraine. The reactor was repaired and restarted on December 1st. 2000. The reactor was shut down again on December 6, 2000. This was because of the soaring temperatures in the water entering the reactor, threatening to cause pump cavitation, as well as damaging the valves and other mechanical systems for the third reactor. The reactor was restarted again once repairs were carried out, limping on at 5% of its power until its official shutdown on December 15, 2000. Jupiter Factory Basement Radiation The basement of the Jupiter Factory is notable for containing extremely high radiation levels, up to 2.5 millisieverts per hour, with a hidden laboratory containing jars of highly radioactive particles such as cesium, plutonium and americium. It turns out that the Jupiter Factory was being used to test ground decontamination methods, but was eventually abandoned with all the radionuclides left inside. The fuel was in the water before the divers drained the water. It is a common belief that the divers who drained the water prevented a theorised thermal explosion that would have dispersed a large amount of nuclear debris around Europe, causing a large part to become uninhabitable. But this is not true. Ignoring the fact that such a scenario is impossible, as the steam could escape, preventing a thermal explosion, it turns out that the fuel had already entered the water, immediately cooling and turning into a pumice-like rock, which floated on the water. 
guards almost killing people escaping the building. On the night of April 26, 1986, a group of survivors, including Oleg Gemrich and Anatoly Kyrgyz, who would be near the reactor hall at the time of the explosion, made their way to the second administration building to get help. The on-duty guard nearly shot and killed the group, believing they were trespassers. It was only when Kyrgyz showed his severe injuries to the guard that they were believed, although he did almost shoot Gemrick again after he attempted to board an ambulance, as he had left his pass inside the building. Strotail Pripyat This is the city of Pripyat's football team, who had a football stadium close to the entrance of the city. The Pripyat football team was actually highly competitive in the Kiev Oblast, having won the Kiev Oblast Football Championship from 1981 to 1983 and was set to play in the championship semi-final against FC Borodyanka in Pripyat on April the 26th. The Yavanhard Stadium had been built for the team to play in, opening on May 1st, 1986, but the team never had the chance to play there. Ivan Orlov Photos Ivan Orlov was one of the forgotten casualties of April 26. A construction worker working for Unit 5, he was on shift a few hundred metres west of Unit 4 and was subsequently exposed to the initial radiation plume, giving him a lethal dose. What is perhaps most tragic, aside from the significant lack of information, is the fact that he is the only victim of Chernobyl without a single photo of him. There are only the carved markings on his grave. Even worse, very few books give any actual details about him. Medvedev's book replaces him with another worker, Vyacheslav Orlov, who actually survived the night. The book and film, Chernobyl, The Final Warning, replaces Ivan Orlov, the construction worker, with Dr. Orlov, a doctor who rushed into the debris pile to help firefighters, likely mistaking Ivan Orlov's personal story with that of Dr. Valentin Belikon, who survived. Even worse for Ivan Orlov, this fake version of him was played by Ian McDermott, the Emperor from Star Wars. Pripyat Military Exercises The city of Pripyat has been used for numerous military exercises, including shortly before the 2022 invasion, which caused damage to the post office, as well as starting a major fire that gutted the interior of the Jubileini Consumer Services Centre and other apartment buildings. But this is not the end of it. In the winter of 2022 into 2023, the city was again used for combat training, involving using RPGs on the apartment buildings and more fires in others. This has caused serious damage to the city of Pripyat and will accelerate the collapse of many buildings. Unit 4 Reserve Control Room Despite many searches and its importance in the events on the night of the disaster, there are currently no available photos of the reserve control room of Unit 4. The closest available are distant photos where you can see in through the window. Precise Dreg Information The exact data for the reactor is currently available online, including the position of the control rods, the flow of water through the main circulation pump, and water levels inside the steam separators. The data helps to present a vivid picture of what the operators were seeing in the last of minutes before the disaster. Operation Needle was a failure. The attempt to measure the reactor temperature and radiation actually turned out to have missed the target. Instead of recording the measurements of the reactor core, they instead measured the temperature and radioactivity of the north spent fuel pool. Somehow, the Soviet scientists did not realise the low temperature and radiation levels of the reactor core until 1989, three years after the operation. Secret Book Collection on the MPP website More than 100 books are currently stored on the Chernobyl MPP website, mainly in Russian, including Midnight in Chernobyl, Sherbak's book, and the photograph collection by Igor Kostin. All of these are free as well. Pilgrim Street Fire Station the Newcastle Pilgrim Street Fire Station in the UK is now abandoned and will be converted into a hotel in the near future. However, it was an active fire station in 1986 and shows solidarity with the victims of Chernobyl by placing the photos of the six firefighter victims 
on the roof of the building. A touching reminder of the solidarity between firefighters across the planet. Unit 2 Turbine Hall Fire Damage Few people are aware of the damage caused to the Unit 2 reactor during the Turbine Hall fire. The collapse of the roof destroyed the feed water pumping equipment for Unit 2 and further damage to the pumps themselves. This forced Unit 2 operators to cut their pumps to the reactor to prevent them from being a fire hazard. Now operating without pumps, putting the reactor in a dangerous situation like Fukushima was in 2011. They were able to correct the situation by opening steam relief valves and supplying the reactor with a singular condensate pump to the steam separators. This prevented a meltdown ultimately, although Unit 2 was not restarted due to this damage. Chernobyl tour was temporarily restricted in the exclusion zone because his tourists went to the toilet in a cooling pond canal. One story from the exclusion zone, unique for the events contained. Denis Vishnevsky detailed in one post how he came across a Chernobyl tour bus nearly three kilometres off route in the exclusion zone during a scientific expedition he was touring. He followed them for 600 more metres when the bus stopped again and the man got off with a packet of wet wipes walking into one of the canals feeding into the cooling pond to go to the toilet a highly radioactive area. For obvious reasons, this blatant disregard of the rules for visiting the exclusion zone resulted in a temporary restriction. V. F. Shovkashitny Vladimir Shovkashitny has an interesting life. Previously serving in the military, he was the shift supervisor of the chemistry shop at the nuclear power plant in 1986. He returned home from a holiday on April 26 and would go on to assist in the decontamination of Units 3 and 4. After the accident, he would become the president of the Chernobyl Union, representing liquidators across the former Soviet Union and around the world from 1990 to 2003. However, Shovka Shitney is maybe well more known for his Chernobyl-based poetry and songs that he would perform. The most famous of these is We Are Birds of the Same Nest, which was shown in the Roland Sergienko film Threshold. Phone transcripts from the night of the disaster. As mentioned earlier, even with the surviving audio and video, information about the accident is limited. However, the phone transcripts from the control room of Unit 3 and 4 and the central control room where Boris Rogozhkin was present were recorded and transcribed by KGB officers. The lack of technical information from the officers means that they are somewhat inaccurate, but they are eligible and give us great insight into the events before and after the explosion. To commemorate the 2023 anniversary of the accident, the Chernobyl nuclear power plant recreated the phone calls in the transcripts with plant employees. P-14 Lena and Bunker The P-14 early warning system was used to detect incoming aerial targets so they could be shot down before they posed a threat. A specific P-14, the Lena, and a corresponding bunker can be found a few kilometres from the town of Chernobyl. The barracks and canteen supplying this small military base also survived the decontamination following the disaster and remain accessible if you seek them. Nineteen eighty four Unit five Canteen Explosion. During the installation of waterproofing at the Unit 5 canteen, a place that could hold 530 people, on the 28th of February 1984, a large explosion occurred. It was later established that the cause of the accident was the use of gasoline bitumen mastic, a waterproofing resin, around the refrigerator, creating gasoline vapours in the air. It is then believed that either an electrical malfunction, or, more likely, a worker lighting up a cigarette, ignited the gases causing the explosion. One worker, Mikhail Ivanovich Anyelenko, was fatally wounded. He was 34 years old. Three other construction workers, Balava, Rudchenko and Savatinsky, were critically injured. Chechorov faked of the rain criticality. Remember the rise in fission due to rain that was mentioned earlier in the iceberg? It has since been revealed that Konstantin Chechorov faked these events to secure more funding for work in the sarcophagus and to speed up work on the new safe confinement. 
This proved somewhat effective, as a matter of fact, and there remains incredible footage of water being poured into the sarcophagus to suppress dust. Missing photos from April 26. Anatoly Raskazov did not just take three photos on April 26. After he returned from the helicopter flight, he was sent to take more photos from the ground. He brought two cameras and photographed a dozen images with each. The film in one camera was destroyed the moment he photographed some graphite. However, the other camera's photos were successfully developed. These images were then confiscated by the KGB and have not been released to the public. Their current whereabouts, if they have not been destroyed, is unknown. Metlenko's assistants. Gennady Metlenko was the representative for Don Tecanego, the group who managed the turbine rundown program on the night of the disaster. He was also accompanied by two assistants who were present in the control room at the time of the explosion. However, their identities have not been released and their fate is unknown. Firefighter plans to cool the reactor. Before it was officially confirmed that the reactor was destroyed to the government commission, firefighters were ordered to draft up plans to extinguish the fire in the reactor hall on the evening of April 26. Some plans were simple, such as using the remains of the fire hydrant system, however it had been destroyed, and using a ladder truck, which was made impossible due to debris instability. Then, they suggested using a giant balloon released by helicopter to lower a one kilometer long pipe attached to a ring into the reactor hall, or using a helicopter to deploy the ring over the reactor directly. None of these plans were ever put in place as the destruction of the reactor was confirmed shortly after the plans were finalized. Exercise bike in the control room. Both before and after the 1986 disaster, operators were not allowed to leave the control room for obvious reasons while they weren't on break. However, this would lead to prolonged periods of boredom and of course negatively impact their health if they sat down for 8 hours a day. To combat this, the nuclear power plant installed exercise equipment in some control rooms to keep the operators entertained. This includes an exercise bike that was fitted into Unit 4 and is actually visible in a video from 1985. The fate of the exercise bike is unknown, but other RBMKs still have gym equipment in their control rooms such as that Ignalina. The Bridge of Death was named because two stalkers were run over on it. The Bridge of Death is an unusual bridge in that it is very steep on both sides, allowing cars to become airborne if they travelled fast enough, as well as making oncoming traffic impossible to see. Even before 1986, the bridge had acquired the name the Bridge of Death because it was the most dangerous road in the area due to its poor design. Frequent car accidents occurred as cars mistakenly veered into the other lane or were too close to the centre of the road, causing them to collide into each other. One incident involved multiple motorcyclists in one accident, and while details are scarce, it would have likely also resulted in multiple casualties. This design proved disastrous even following the accident, as two stalkers who had been looting Pripyat were killed in a traffic collision with a military truck that they hadn't seen on the other side of the bridge. After that, the nickname The Bridge of Death became internationally known. The fictional story of people dying on the bridge was given later. Chernobyl, 10 years later, Inevitability or Chance. This book is a very rare Chernobyl book, which is a shame given how much useful information is contained within. Despite having testimony from dozens of people involved, including the last shift of Razin Dathlet by Ev mentioned earlier, the book had a very limited physical copy release and there are no e-books, making all of the other information very hard to find. Sviatoslav Vakachuk's Concert Sviatoslav Vakachuk is one of Ukraine's biggest modern song artists, and on May 13th, 2022, after the Russian invasion, he performed inside the nuclear power plant. With just a guitar and a stool, he sang his hit song, Everything Will Be Kind. It might indeed be the first song performed inside the nuclear power plant. Stolen Graphite Blocks A number of graphite blocks were left discarded around the nuclear power plant, some intended for Unit 5 and others that were discarded for being unusable. As a result, these were eventually stolen while unsupervised 
and dispersed across the exclusion zone and around the world. The precise location of these and how many are missing is unknown. Kalimanchuk Calculations Vladimir Kalimanchuk was a nuclear scientist who helped develop the calculations for the last few seconds inside the Chernobyl Reactor 4 before the explosions. The data produced has been instrumental in supporting INSAG-7, although the actual calculations themselves are hard to find. Ala Pugacheva in Chernobyl Pugacheva is a Soviet Russian singer who has been performing since 1965. On September 9, 1986, Pugacheva performed a gig at the Green Cape Camp for Liquidators, alongside other rock bands the day before. Pugacheva didn't just compete at Green Cape for Chernobyl charity work. Earlier in the year, she performed in Moscow as part of the Chernobyl Aid concert, inspired by Live Aid. Krog Ionosphere Research Station Two kilometres southwest of the Duke of Radar is the Krog Ionosphere Research Station. Composed of a 200 meter wide circle of 240 antennas, the research station was used to probe the ionosphere, the part of the atmosphere that touches space. It was thought that this ring of ray could detect the direction of an oncoming missile through the electromagnetic signal it produced. It did not actually work as intended, but was still used for other ionosphere experiments. Today, the road to the station is overgrown and it is very rare for tour guides to visit this location. Graveyard near the Reactor 5 and 6 cooling towers. The cooling pond was not originally an empty field. The village of Nagotsi and the Podlesny farm were located in the area. The buildings were destroyed, the population displaced, and the area then dug out to form the cooling pond. The only evidence left of their existence is the Nagotsi cemetery and the Fish Farm Radiobiological Laboratory built nearby. Chernobyl Castle Ruins In the 14th to 20th centuries, the town Chernobyl, for which the nuclear power plant and the area was named, also contained a castle. The castle has since been destroyed, but the ruins are known to still exist, although no known photos remain, as the area is covered in dense vegetation. Old, new safe confinement plans. It isn't just the sarcophagus that has changed design. The new safe confinement has also gone through multiple changes from proposed concrete domes to eventually the iconic arch, chosen because it could be slid into place. Even then, the design has changed from originally including the entire vent stack to the vent stack being dismantled. Firefighter training. There are a few pieces of information about the training the firefighters partook in before the 1986 disaster. From what we know, Firefighters largely practiced on units 3 and 5, seen in such photos as this. This became a problem that night, as the firefighters had to contend with the hydrant positions being reversed to what they had trained on. Not very good. Humpbacked Polish Chuck Gay Club In one of the villages in the zone, someone has turned a building into a gay club. The name Humpbacked Polish Chuck Gay Club has been inscribed into the door and a variety of provocative images have been pinned to the walls. What actually happens here is unknown, as no videos or photos of the place in use have been released online, although we can probably guess. Graphite in Grandma's Garden Remember how I mentioned the stolen graphite blocks earlier in the lair? Well, it appears that one of these might have been discarded with a babushka that was visited by Kreyasan in one of his videos. It won't be radioactive, but be careful not to drop it. Hodomchuk's last words. Valery Hodomchuk is known to have died in the explosion. However, the phone calls released by the KGB may have captured his final words before he died. They are nothing of significance. Translated as, I need to recharge the lower feed for 22. Okay, come on. So it's shortened one. It suggests that a mechanical fault may have occurred on the 22nd pump two minutes before the explosion. It also shows the calmness in the pump hole before the explosion. A photo of the north main circulation pump with hole is here. The second closest engine is the 22nd pump. This is most likely the location for Hodumchuk's body. The pink liquid within the sarcophagus. Many rare photos of the interior of the sarcophagus are available online. Many of them show the scientists measuring the depth of water that pools inside the building. One of them also appears to show a pink coloured liquid 
of unknown origin that the worker has to lean over to measure. The cause of the colour, and the precise location inside the building, is unknown. However, I may have a good suggestion to the answer of the first question. The pink may be the anti-radiation paint that coats much of the inside of the building, which was washed off due to rain entering the destroyed structure, pooling in this area of the building. Leningrad MPP tank explosion. On the 7th of January 1975, just 67 days after Leningrad Unit 1, the first RBMK reactor went online. An explosion occurred inside a concrete tank that stored radioactive aerosols from Leningrad Unit 1. According to the reports at the time, there was no external radiation release, indicating that the explosion was minor and dealt with quickly. However, it would become the first in a long line of accidents, not only at Leningrad, but at every RVMK plant around the country. Sergei Ruvin. From 1988 to 1990, Orithin worked in Chernobyl as a scientist for the Ministry of Defence, and after the accident, he assisted in the creation of the Chernobyl Union, and he, like Shovka Shitney, became a senior member of the Union, and also created his own poetry that he sang while playing the guitar. More than half an hour of his music is available on YouTube, which is much less known than Shovka Shitney's work. Kutor Zlotnev Perhaps the most unexplored section of the zone, seen by almost nobody and on virtually no maps. Rumours about this farm are rife. It is claimed that one person lives here, a woman, aged over 100, who chose not to leave after the disaster. People who evacuated from nearby into Belarus already have names for her. A sorceress. A witch. People who deliver food to the self-settlers of the exclusion zone refuse to speak about Kutor Zlotnev beyond telling people there is nothing to do there. Those who have gone claim to have seen animal bones on the ground, amulets, and an atmosphere that made them want to leave the area immediately. One stalker who did venture here claimed to have seen an old man in a window watching the group, but when they looked back, he was gone. Due to the lack of mobile coverage in the area, it is very rare for anyone to go here. On Google Earth, only a few buildings and foundations can be seen in the area. And so we wrap up part three, the finale of the iceberg. And what an adventure it has been. To everyone who has stuck around until the very end, thank you. And again, please be sure to like and subscribe. I have a few new videos coming out soon that have been written by some fellow experts that I hope everyone will enjoy. And then in September, we will be taking a break from Chernobyl for another nuclear accident, a project I've been working on for the past four years. Again, thank you for watching. Goodbye.